Norman, look at you. I can say I that because I can actually look at you because today we're on YouTube I as well as podcast. I'm you lovingly. It's your birthday. <laughs> and it's your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> The folks at home don't need to know that. I do love looking at this, though, because you look like a movie star, uh, as usual, and I look very much like someone who works in podcasting. <laughs> as they say in broadcasting, bullshit. <laughs> well, yes, that's true, folks. We are doing a YouTube version of CoronaCast as well as the Trusty Podcast. Um, I hope you like it. It was a bit of an experiment. If you're listening to us with your ears and wondering what on earth we're talking about and want to see what these voices in your head look like in real life, um, check out the show notes. We'll put the link to the YouTube channel in there as well. Spoiler alert, the bloke's really ugly. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, that's a lie, by the way. Let's get on with CoronaCast, that show all about the coronavirus and also sometimes other nasties as well. I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turable Land. And I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan coming to you from Gadigal Land. It's Wednesday the 7th of June 2023. So Norman, my favourite thing to do to kick off a CoronaCast these days is to just throw news headlines at you and make you respond to them quickly and it's the quick part that I find most enjoyable. First up, can we talk about garlic? There was a couple of headlines in the news this past week. This is where I'm so glad I'm distant from. <laughs> well, yeah, well, just uh, as a protective uh, measure against vampires mostly, I'm a massive garlic consumer. There were headlines around in Australian news this week indicating that maybe it was a good idea as to ward off COVID as well. But if you read more than about the first line of that news, you would see that it was cells in a dish that they did this research on. Some people have really grabbed onto it. For me, as a health reporter and a science communicator, it's a real sort of like crystallisation of this, th the thing that can happen when we have science by press release or like a really sexy top line without necessarily being underpinned by science. Yeah, this was laboratory research done at the Doherty Institute. And the Doherty Institute released us, I think were so upset by the media coverage, they released a very short, testy, um, release, I think, the, the day or two afterwards. So this, this was the industry, industry-sponsored research looking at garlic extract and its effect on viruses, particularly influenza and COVID, <clears throat> and found some degree of inhibition in the, in the laboratory. And from that to actually generalising to this is a great thing to do and eat garlic and it's going to ward off the virus the same way as it wards off vampires is a long way to go. I mean, I've looked at garlic over the years. There is something going for garlic. Um, I mean, it tastes it, delicious. It tastes delicious. It interacts with other foods when you cook with it, um, as opposed to raw garlic. It depends on when you pick it, what um, breed of garlic, what, you know, what kind of garlic it is, what soil it's grown in. There's so many variables with garlic, but this was an extract and, again, promoted by the industry. It's a long way to go before we can say garlic in some shape or form is going to help you against viruses. So is there anything to it at all? Who knows? Um, and I think the Doherty Institute themselves say, who knows? You, you've got to do more research and find out. Further research required. Okay, moving on. Uh, the Tour de France is coming up. I hear that that's a big bike race or something. Uh, I and think so. And they're um, reinstating mask rules, which for Europe, I don't know, I think I have this feeling that Europe had sort of gone back to something much more like normal, um, much more quickly than Australia did. And yet they're really trying to protect the peloton, specifically the cyclists in the race from catching COVID as they've got a surge on there like it is everywhere. Yeah, there's a surge on, it's not seasonal and they've got a very expensive high profile bike race and they don't want people falling over literally with COVID-19. And so they're trying to use masks in certain dense, dense situations to protect riders from each other. I should clear, clarify, the riders themselves don't have to wear masks while racing, uh, but it is things like the riders, team staff, officials wearing face masks at sign on, kind of being discouraged from doing things like taking selfies and signing autographs, this real sort of social distancing well, they'll be banned from that, in fact. Yeah. So I think you know it's smart stuff on their part. The extent to which it will prevent COVID remains to be seen because there's lots of opportunities to catch it. But um, let's hope it does reduce the incidence. One piece of interesting research coming out of the Netherlands is into memory and concentration problems and how they've increased in adults since the start of the pandemic. I am feeling some memory and concentration problems the, uh, today myself, Norman, but that might be due to my advanced age. There's increasing evidence being reported of memory problems, uh, emotional problems, or should I say psychological issues, concentration, brain fog, 
et cetera, et cetera, that are prolonged after COVID. And in fact, there's another study out which suggests that there's increased signs of brain inflammation post-COVID, which shouldn't surprise us since you do get triggering of the immune system in some people with, uh, with, uh, po- in post-COVID. There's lots of different reasons. There could be virus left in the brain. It could just be an immune response. But you know, there is no doubt that um, one form of um, post-acute um, SARS-CoV-2 infection is a brain effect. And the extent of that brain effect has yet to be fully described. Yeah, it's one of those things that you really can't tell what the long-term effects are until we've had a long-term amount of time and we're really only in year four. Is this something that we're going to be seeing more of over the coming decades? Uh, well, I hope not, but we might well. And you and I... In terms of understanding it better, the, the long-term effects? Yes, is the answer to that question. And there's We've got better tools at hand in terms of imaging, what's called molecular imaging of of the brain and other tissues to find out more about this. And of course, one of the theories behind Alzheimer's disease is that it might be triggered by a virus. And you and I on the Health Report podcast uh, a week or two ago talked about uh, really interesting research from the UK yet to be published showing that shingles vaccine might protect against Alzheimer's disease in some people. Now, it may well be that COVID-19 has an effect on nerves, which is lasting. Let's hope not. But that is one of the things that's worrying people. OK, Norman, well, let's talk about the Australian context. And I do want to get into the tools that we've got in our tool chest at the moment to help protect, protect people against severe disease, things like antivirals. But before we get to that, can we have an update on what the numbers are like in Australia at the moment? Because it really feels like there's a surge on. There is a surge on. Um, and as I said before, this is not seasonal yet. It's around the world. Um, they're talking about millions of cases in China, but how would you know and how would they know? Because testing's really gone by the wayside. One of the ways to actually measure this is hospitalizations, and hospitalizations are on the rise. Um, at the end of last week, the latest federal data suggested about 2,600 rolling average, seven day rolling average people in hospital. Big differences between the states. Um, New South Wales, 1,400 people in hospital, 1.3 or 4 of equivalent of a large teaching hospital in hospital with uh, COVID disease, um, whereas Victoria is much lower than that. It's maybe about a third of that, less than a third of that. So we've got, the question is why equivalent state sizes, some one state's much lower than another. Um, we can come back to that in a moment. But there's a lot of people in hospital taking up hospital beds. The mortality rate once you get into hospital is actually quite high. It's about 6%. If you catch it in hospital, because there are a lot of people in hospital, and you get cross-infection, the mortality rate is even higher than that that, according to data that I've seen, um, because of the frail populations. This is not, this is a, this is significant and you've got the long COVID um, uh, there on the tail. And remember, one of the best protections against severe disease is immunisation, but the other, as you alluded to, is antivirals. Yeah, so there's two antivirals. The, the sort of two main ones that we've got here in Australia are Paxlovid, which is made up of a combination of um, drugs that I won't try to pronounce on air right now, and Molnupiravir, which is also known as Ligevrio. They were really breakthrough drugs when they first came onto the market. We talked last year about how it was hard for people to get their hands on them, but has the supply increased now? Is it something that people are using? Because with the reduction of masks and social distancing, with um, people being under-vaccinated, as we've spoken about um, in the last couple of weeks, they could be a really important part of helping temper the severity of this wave. Well, and indeed they are. And one wonders whether, in fact, the difference between New South Wales and other states in terms of hospitalizations might be because of antivirals or maybe there's just more COVID-19 in uh, in New South Wales. I haven't seen the state breakdowns of antivirals, so maybe doing New South Wales a disservice. But the, there's there's been data published in the Medical Journal of Australia looking at just this and could we be doing better? Because there's no question that if uh, eligible people get um um, one of these antivirals, particularly Paxlovid, which is more effective than, than Molnupiravir, you get significant reductions in the risk of severe disease, hospitalisation and death. So in this Medical Journal of Australia perspective piece that, you, that you're referencing here, what do they say are the missing links for us when it comes to using antivirals as effectively as we can be in Australia at the moment? Their main point is that we actually need better data. Um, so that GPs and state and federal authorities understand on a real-time basis, week by week, what's the story in terms of antiviral prescribing, not just on average over the whole population, 
but by postcode so that you can see whether or not there are deficiencies in areas where there might be a shortage of GPs. It may add to the argument that pharmacists should have the right to prescribe these antivirals in areas where there is underprescribing going on, not through the fault of particular GPs, but maybe because simply people cannot get enough access. You can get a telehealth appointment here. Uh, I mean, another thing here, by the way, is that you should be doing rat testing. If you're vulnerable, you should be doing uh, rapid antigen testing um, so that you know whether or not you've got COVID and you can respond to it very quickly to protect yourself. Um, and, and so there are, there are multiple things that should happen, but there needs to be a lot of activity out there in terms of real-time observation about what's going on so that you can put a lid on it. I mean, 1.4 teaching hospitals filled with COVID, people with severe COVID disease in New South Wales as an enormous resource strain, as well as a, a huge risk to those individuals. So a question from Debbie on this. Um, she says, I would like to hear Dr. Norman Swan talk about so-called rebound COVID uh, because she's been told by her GP and also read online that when someone suffering from COVID takes things like Paxlovid, they might test negative at seven days, but then after they come off the drug, they can test positive again and have symptoms that re reappear. Yeah, it's a real phenomenon. President Biden had it. Um, there's various theories as to why it happens. One is that the uh, course that was given in the randomised trials, which is the course that's allowed by various authorities around the world, um, is not sufficient to get rid of the virus completely from your body and therefore it comes back. The evidence is that when it does come back, it's much milder. So you, you're still reasonably protected against severe disease. What about other reasons why people might have persisting symptoms? Well, it's not as well researched, but the, there is tantalising evidence that um, extended COVID symptoms like long COVID are lower in people who have anti had antivirals, which makes sense because they're getting rid of the virus from your system and therefore the virus is less likely to do any damage and persist. So it's another strong reason for getting an antiviral. And in fact, if it does, these antivirals do work in younger groups. Um, it's going to cost a lot of money, but um, if you can expand the eligibility criteria, it may well have a huge population effect in terms of long COVID symptoms. Needs more data seems to be the theme of today's CoronaCast. Uh, well, it's Almost actually where we'll leave it there. Before we go, Norman, I have a little confession to make What's to you. That? I'm cheating on you. Oh, no. I'm, Who cheating on you. I'm cheating on you with another show. Oh, no. You're um, hussy. Um, <laughs> it's you know like those um artists who like have like a solo album it's sort of like my solo album i have a new show uh hosted by just me it's called quick smart it's uh once a week 10 minutes it's me digging into one big idea and helping people like me who don't have enough time to read the news from cover to cover every day to feel more informed i forgive you and i'll listen you should i'll it's subscribe <laughs> It's on the ABC Listen app and all of the other uh, places. You have and to tell me when you're recording it so I can heckle. <laughs> I would welcome it gladly. In fact, maybe I'll even get you on uh, to have a chat with me on the show at some stage. Mm, I don't think so. Once, you, once you've gone, you've gone. You know, I'm, oh, okay. I'm, moving, on. I'm moving on. I see how it is. No, it's called Quick Smart. It's on the ABC Listen app. And we might even drop uh, an episode of it in this feed in a couple of days' time, just as a little taster. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. See you then. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.